The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure, by Father Michael Müller. Chapter 14. Additional Examples Relating to the Real Presence. Podbert relates that a certain priest named Plegio asked of our Savior the favor to be permitted to see him with his bodily eyes in the Holy Eucharist. As this request did not proceed from unbelief, but rather from an ardent love, it was granted. One day during Mass, this pious priest knelt down after the consecration and besought our Lord anew to grant his request. An angel then appeared to him and bade him arise. He raised his head and saw our divine Savior in the form of an infant. Full of joy and reverence, he begged our Lord to conceal himself again under the sacramental species, and immediately the Holy Eucharist assumed its usual appearance. This miracle was also witnessed by many other persons. The Abbe Favre also relates a miracle which took place at Turin in the year 1453 during the pontificate of Nicholas V. One night a thief entered one of the churches of the city and stole the sacred vessels. He then loaded his horse with the sacred burden and attempted to leave the city at daybreak, but his horse fell on its knees, and with all his efforts the thief could not make it rise. The people at length began to suspect something, so they took off the burden from the horse and found, to their horror, the sacred vessels. A consecrated host, which had remained in the ciborium, rose into the air to the height of about sixty feet. The bishop, hearing of this fact, went in procession to the place accompanied by a great multitude. As soon as he arrived there, the holy host descended into the chalice, which he held in his hand, and was carried to St. John's Cathedral. A splendid church was erected in the spot in which this great miracle happened, and on the balustrade the following inscription is still to be seen. Hic statit equus. This miracle is still annually commemorated by a festival kept throughout the whole diocese and by a solemn procession in the city of Turin. God was pleased to work this miracle to confirm the faith of the people against the errors of the Hussites and Albigenses, who were then ravaging that part of Italy. A few years ago, during one of these annual processions, another miracle took place, which is too remarkable to be, to be admitted. An impious barber had the impertinence to ridicule a person whom he was shaving for wishing to assist at this procession. He then went into the street in order to insult the Catholics and to ridicule the Blessed Sacrament. He kept his hat on and would not take it off, though repeatedly, repeatedly ordered to do so. But behold, the moment that the Blessed Sacrament passed by him, he was struck by the divine justice and fell to the ground a corpse. This event made such an impression on the whole city that the commissary caused the body of the impious man to be exposed before the courthouse for thirty-six hours. A great many of the eyewitnesses of this fact are still living, among others Emreat, formerly rector of Plancherin in the Diocese of Chauberg, who was staying at Turin when this melancholy occurrence took place. In 1369, the following incident occurred in, in the Netherlands. A Jew of Enghien named Jonathus, prefect of the synagogue, persuaded a Jew of Brussels named John de Louvain, who was apparently converted to Christianity, to bring him some consecrated hosts. The latter, urged on by the promise of a large sum of money, entered one night the church of St. John the Baptist at Malenbeck, which was situated without the city, took the ciborium containing fifteen hosts, and gave it to Jonathus. This wicked Jew now began to offer every imaginable indignity and outrage to our blessed Lord in the mystery of his love. A few days after this occurrence, Jonathus was murdered. His wife, considering his death to be a just, just chastisement of God, and fearing lest she might be punished in a similar manner, went to Brussels and gave the ciborium with the hosts to some Jews who preserved them till Good Friday of the year 1370. On this day, they created the sacred host with they treated the, the sacred host with every kind of indignity. At last, they pierced them, and immediately miraculous blood began to flow from them. These impious wretches were so terrified at this sight that they fell to the ground. On recovering from their terror, they resolved to send the host to the Jews of Cologne. A woman named Catherine was charged with this commission. She, however, full of fear and remorse of conscience, carried the host to her parish priest at Isla Chapelle and gave him an account of all that had happened. The priest then informed the duke and duchess of the whole affair. The impious Jews were arrested and tried, and having been fully convicted of the crime, they suffered the punishment they so justly deserved. This happened on the eve of Ascension Day, 1370. This history is recorded in, this, in the archives of the city of Brussels. The sacred hosts are still preserved in the church of St. Gudo in the same city. There are also several pictures in this church representing this event. The following miracle is related by St. Francis de Sales. In a certain church in the town of Favernay in France, the Blessed Sacrament was once exposed on the side altar to the adoration of the faithful. During the exposition, a spark happening to fall from one of the lighted tapers set the altar on fire. 
In a short time everything was destroyed. Even the repository in which the Blessed Sacrament was kept was consumed. The Blessed Sacrament itself, however, remained in its place, and when the priest endeavored to carry it to the high altar, he found that he could not move it. He then began to celebrate Mass, and when he came to the consecration, the host came of its own accord to the high altar and remained there till after communion, when it returned to its former place and remained suspended in the air as before. This miracle was repeated for several years in succession. St. Francis de Sales says that he himself made a pilgrimage to the place in order to witness this miracle. In the year 1563, a Lutheran nobleman in the city of Erfurt ridiculed the Blessed Sacrament as it was carried in the procession by the Reverend Father Baumer. Behold, said he, what a ridiculous thing that old man is carrying. No sooner had he uttered these words than he fell speechless to the ground. Dr. Hebernstreet was instantly called in but pronounced him beyond recovery. A few days after, the nobleman was a corpse. Many facts of the kind have occurred even in our own day. The three following are related on the authority of ecclesiastics who were inhabitants of the places in which they occurred. There lived at Whitham, near A la Chapelle, a pious person who was accustomed to see Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament whenever she assisted at Mass. Now one day she did not behold our Lord as usual. She went therefore to the priest after Mass and said, Reverend Father, you have committed such and such a fault, and this is why I did not, as usual, see Jesus Christ during your Mass. The priest was filled with surprise at these words, as he knew that what she said was true. In Holland, a church was set on fire. Among those present was an old man who rushed boldly into the flames in order to take away the Blessed Sacrament. Immediately the flames divided before him and left him a passage to the high altar. He then took down the Blessed Sacrament and carried it away without receiving the slightest injury. A painting representing this miraculous occurrence is still to be seen in the church in which it took place. About thirty years ago, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, several of the, de- the citizens of Duren, near A la Chapelle, were sitting together in an inn fronting the great marketplace when the solemn procession of the Most Holy Sacrament passed by. Among those present was the son of the Burgomaster. Now, as the priest gave the benediction with the Blessed Sacrament at the altar that had been erected in the square, this young man held up a silver dollar in his hand and mimicked this sacred ceremony. In a few days, the very arm with which he had committed this crime began to mortify the mortification soon extended to the shoulder, and after a short time, the unhappy man died. Moreover, from this moment, the blessing of God forsook his house. Several of his family died, and the rest sunk into poverty and disgrace. The three following instances will be of special interest as they are happened in this country. In the year 1824, Mrs. Anne Mattingly of Washington, D.C., was miraculously cured of a severe illness in the following manner. She had been suffering from a dangerous cancer for seven years. Every remedy was tried, but in vain. The disease was incurable. She lost the use of her left arm. Her back and shoulders became ulcerated in consequence of her long confinement to her bed, and the symptoms of approaching dissolution began to appear. In this state, finding that all natural means were unavailing, she had recourse to God. In concert with Prince Hohenlo and her pastor, the Reverend Stephen L. Dubesson, she began a novena in the honor of the most holy name of Jesus, and at the end of the novena she received the Blessed Sacrament. When she was about to receive Holy Communion, believing that the time had come when she must either die or be restored to health, she uttered these words, Lord Jesus, thy holy will be glorified. Her tongue was so rough and parched from fever that she was unable to swallow the host for five or six minutes, but the moment she swallowed it, all pain instantly left her. Her body was entirely healed, and she found herself in perfect health. She immediately arose and dressed herself, and after having knelt down to give thanks to God, she received hundreds of visitors who came to congratulate her and witness the miracle. These facts are all attested by a number of competent witnesses, and anyone who desires to examine the evidence can find a full statement of the case in the works of Bishop England. At the burning of the Ursuline Convent near Charleston, Massachusetts, when the nuns were driven from the cloister at the hour of midnight by a fanatical mob, one of the ruffians had the hardihood to open the tabernacle, and seizing the sacred vessels, he poured into the pocket of a companion the the consecrated hosts which they contained. The latter, on his way back to Charleston, treated the sacred particles with the most atrocious irreverence, and even jestingly offered them to a tavern keeper in payment for the liquor he had drank. He then returned home and related to his wife an account of the night's proceedings. Shortly afterwards he went into the yard, but as he did not return the family became uneasy and sought after him everywhere. After searching for some time, they found him a ghastly corpse. He had died the death of Arius. This fact was related by the late Bishop Fenwick of Boston. 
The Reverend Anthony Urbanek, who in the years 1847 and 1848 exercised the functions of the most holy ministry in the city of Milwaukee in the state of Wisconsin, gave the following account of a wonderful conversion wrought by the recital of the Hail Mary. He frequently visited a Protestant family by the name of Polworth, natives of Hanover, but then residing a few hours' drive from Milwaukee. After a short time, Mrs. Polworth joined the Catholic Church, but her husband remained obstinate and would often say that he would never become a Catholic. He would not even allow his children to be baptized, although his wife resorted to every possible means to obtain his consent. All who knew him used to say it would require nothing less than a miracle to make a Catholic of Polworth. The priest continued his visits, and their conversation gen- generally fell upon the truths of Catholicity. But every effort to convince Mr. Polworth was vain. He had always a thousand objections to present. On one of these visits, after having long and uselessly endeavored to open the eyes of his headstrong friend to the truth of the Catholic faith, Reverend Urbanek at last said to him, I see well, Mr. Polworth, that I can do nothing with you. At that moment, the good priest was suddenly inspired with a feeling of extraordinary confidence in the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, and, continuing to address Mr. Polworth, he added, But you must at least promise me one thing. What may that be? asked his friend in the low German dialect. I will tell you after you all have promised it, answered Reverend Mr. Urbanek. It is not difficult, and you can conscientiously do it. After a good deal of argument, Mr. Polworth finally promised to do what might be asked of him. Then, said the priest, say on every Sunday henceforth one Hail Mary, for my intention, and you will in short time experience a great change in your feelings. Mr. Polworth laughed at these words, but he kept his promise faithfully. About fourteen days after the promise was made, he suddenly accosted his wife thus, I am going to Milwaukee now, to buy some new clothes for the children. The astonished wife asked, But why at this time so particularly? Well, I have at last made up my mind to let the children be baptized, was his reply. The news spread like wildfire through the entire neighborhood. Polworth has at length consented to have his children baptized, was in everyone's mouth. He, moreover, begged the Reverend Mr. Urbanek to have the ceremony performed with the greatest solemnity. The Reverend Pastor invited another priest and two clerics to assist at the baptism, which took place before High Mass. After Mass, the Most Blessed Sacrament was exposed and the hymn Pange Lingua sung by the choir. The newly baptized children stood close to the altar steps and their father immediately behind them. During the singing of the hymn, it suddenly occurred to Mr. Polworth to look at the Blessed Sacrament, but being forced by the immense crowd that was pressing towards the sanctuary to stand, if he would not kneel upon his children, he feared lest a free glance at the sacred host might have the appearance of irreverence. However, he was not long able to resist the inclination. He looked towards the altar and saw the sacred host, as it always is, but it soon increased to the size of a millstone, and in the center of it there appeared the good shepherd, with a lamb upon his shoulders. The sight did not perplex the man. He wished to convince himself of what he seemed to see. He accordingly closed one eye for a while, and thus looked at the apparition, and then again with both eyes, until he was fully satisfied that there was no illusion in the matter. Besides, it was a clear Monday, and he was standing scarcely two steps from the altar. After the lapse of about five minutes, his vision disappeared, and the sacred host resumed its original appearance. On leaving the church, Polworth asked some of his neighbors whether they had seen nothing singular during the divine service, but when he perceived that they knew nothing of the apparition, he said no more. The next day, he invited the priest to pay him a visit, and as soon as Reverend Mr. Urbanek entered the house, Polworth said, Now indeed is the lost sheep at last found, after its long straying among the breers. I wish to become a Catholic. A few days later, he was received into the church, and after he had made his profession of faith, he solemnly attested by oath to the truth of the vision above related. On the same day, a bigoted Calvinist was baptized. Upon the simple assurance of Mr. Polworth of what had taken place, he had been converted. The right reverend bishop granted to the congregation of the church, in which the wonder had taken place, the privilege of having on every 16th of July, the day of the apparition, a solemn procession with the Blessed Sacrament exactly as on Corpus Christi. Polworth and his family always go to communion on this day. Towards the close of the last century, there lived a very impious man in Rottweil, a little town of Swabia, Germany. One day, when in the most solemn procession of the Corpus Christi, the Blessed Sacrament passed by the house of this impious wretch, he had the diabolical audacity to scoff at the Blessed Sacrament in a most horrid manner. He placed himself before the window in his shirt sleeves, with his butcher's apron on and a white nightcap on his head. By appearing in this unbecoming dress, he wished to show his contempt and disrespect to the Holy Eucharist. What was still worse, was, as the Blessed Sacrament passed by him, he spat upon it. Only a few persons noticed his impiety, otherwise it would have been immediately avenged. 
But what men failed to do God was not slow in, in accomplishing. This blasphemer soon after died the death of a reprobate. This, however, was not all. The dreadful scandal which he had given, and which had become generally known, and the outrage which, 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 which he had offered the divine majesty, required a public act of reparation. God made use of the following means to effect this. Immediately after the death of this impious man, such horrible noises, such frightful groans, lamentations, and howlings were heard in his house that no one could stand it any longer. Every person easily guessed the cause of it. The difficulty was how to remove it. At last, as if inspired by God, they had recourse to the following expedient. It was resolved that this man's portrait should be painted in the same dress and posture in which he had appeared to scoff at the Blessed Sacrament, and that the painting should be placed in the opening of the wall instead of the window, in order to show all who should pass by how God punishes the scoffers of the Blessed Sacrament. Strange to say, no sooner was this painting placed in the wall than the house became quiet. Some years afterwards, the wife of a Protestant preacher who lived opposite could no longer bear the sight of this horrid portrait. Accordingly, her husband went to the civil magistrate to obtain his, an ordinance for the removal of the picture. His petition was granted, but no sooner was the painting removed than the former frightful scenes returned and continued until the alarmed people of the house obtained permission to restore the painting to its place. One of our fathers related this event to me as an eyewitness of the fact. In a procession at Valencia, when Blessed Nicholas Fattori was carrying the Blessed Sacrament, all at once a flock of birds came and formed a crown just above the canopy, singing most melodiously and steadily accompanying the procession, their warbling notes harmonizing beautifully with the ecclesiastical chant. When afterwards he was asked about this, he answered with a smile that they were angels who came from heaven to honor their divine king. At the time when modern heresies in relation to the real presence were arising, our Lord was pleased to illustrate this doctrine by a miracle. A nobleman of Tyrol named Oswald Molser, on coming to make his paschal communion, insisted on being communicated with a large host. This was an act of pride and unbelief, but the priest was induced, through human respect, to give him a large host instead of a small one, such as are ordinarily given. But in the very moment when the host was placed on his tongue, the ground opened under his feet as if to swallow him. He had already sunk down to his knees when he was seized, when he seized hold of the altar, which yielded like wax to his hand. Seeing now the vengeance of God under overtaking him, he repented of his pride and prayed for mercy. As God would not permit him to swallow the sacred host, the priest removed it and replaced it in the tabernacle. It was the color of blood. The author who records this says that he himself saw the host tinged with blood, the altar bearing the impress of Oswald's hands, and the ground into which he was sinking still hollow and covered with iron bars. Witnesses testify to these visible evidences of the miracle even to the present day. Three years ago, one of our priests received a letter from his father in Trevay, Germany. In this letter, a very melancholy example was related that occurred in, in that city on the occasion of the solemn procession of Corpus Christi. When the procession passed by the house of a certain Protestant gentleman, his servant girl, who was Catholic, said to her master, "'Oh, come and see the splendid procession and the faith of the Catholics.' In answer to this invitation, the gentleman uttered a most horrible blasphemy against the Blessed Sacrament. No sooner had it left the blasphemous lips than he fell to the ground dead. The whole city looked upon this instantaneous death as an evident chastisement of God for the horrible crime of blasphemy. One day, said the cure of ours, when, ca when catechizing the people, two Protestant ministers came to me who did not believe in the real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. I said to them, do you think a piece of bread could detach itself and, of its own accord, go and place itself on the tongue of a person who came to receive it? No, said he. Well, then, it is not bread, saintly curé then related the following fact. There was a man who had doubts about the real presence, and he said, What do you know about it? It is not certain what consecration is, what happens on the altar at that moment. But this man wished to believe, and he prayed to the Blessed Virgin to obtain faith for him. Listen attemp attentively to this. I do not say that this happened somewhere, but I say that it happened to myself. At the moment this man came up to receive Holy Communion, the sacred host detached itself from my fingers, while I was yet a, a good way off, went off itself, and placed itself upon the tongue of that man. The same curé relates also that a priest once, after consecration, had some little doubt whether his few words could have made our Lord descend upon the altar. At the same moment, he saw the host all red, and the corporeal tent tinged with, with blood. Charles II, King of Spain, took a ride in his carriage at Madrid on the 20th of January, 1685, accompanied by many personages of nobility and high rank, and followed by a large concourse of the common people. 
Perceiving a priest approaching with the Blessed Sacrament, he quickly alighted from his carriage and knelt down to adore his Savior in the Holy Eucharist, after which he begged the priest to take his place in the carriage. Taking his hat in his left hand and holding like a coachman the reins of the horses, followed on foot with uncovered head to the house of the sick person. Here he again knelt down to adore his Lord and God in the Blessed Sacrament. He served the priest to the best of his power. Finally, he bestowed a rich present on the family, in order that the sick man might die with less solicitude for those he was to leave behind him. It may excite surprise to hear that irrational animals can teach us lessons of reverence towards the Most Holy Sacrament, but such is the case. There are not a few instances on record which prove that the divine author of nature has been pleased sometimes so to direct the instinct of brutes that, by their behavior, they might confound the pride of heretics and infidels or awaken the devotion of lukewarm and indifferent Catholics. In the life of St. Anthony of Padua, a very striking miracle is recorded. As Almighty God, by the prophet Isaiah, proposed the docility of the ox and ass as a rebuke to the stubbornness of the children of Israel, so in this instance he made use of a brute beast to reprove the folly of those who rejected the mystery of the real presence. In the time of St. Anthony of Padua, there lived at Tolosa, a city of Spain, a very obstinate heretic, Bovilus by name, who denied the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Although St. Anthony compelled him to acknowledge interiorly the truth of this doctrine, he persisted obstinately in his heresy. At last he professed his willingness to believe, provided he should see a miracle wrought in proof of it. What then do you desire? St. Anthony asked. I will, said the heretic, keep my my mule without food for three days. Afterwards I will bring him to you. On one side I will place food before him, and on the other side you shall stand with the blessed sacrament. In case the mule leaves the food and goes to you, I will believe that Jesus Christ is truly and really present in the blessed sacrament. St. Anthony, having agreed to the proposal, on the day appointed, a great concourse of people were assembled together in the public square to see the issue. St. Anthony, after having said Mass, took the Blessed Sacrament and carried it with him to the square. Then, when the hungry animal had been brought near and food put before him, St. Anthony, holding in his hands the Blessed Sacrament, thus spoke, In the name of my Creator, whom I am not worthy to hold in my hands, I command thee to draw near and prostrate thyself before thy God, to give due honor to him, that the heretics may learn from thee how they ought to worship their God in the Blessed Sacrament. And behold, no sooner had St. Anthony thus spoken than the mule left his food, went before the Blessed Sacrament, and bowed his head to the ground as if to adore it. At this sight, Bovilus and many other heretics were converted and professed their faith in the real presence. St. Francis of Assisi, whose power over irrational creatures almost carries us back to the days of a man's original innocence, was followed by sheep wherever he went. The sheep went into the church and, during the time of Mass, would keep quiet until the consecration, when it would kneel down as if to adore its Creator. The most striking fact of this reverence shown by animals, and one which would seem almost incredible if its truth was not vouched by such authors as John Eusebius and Stephen Minocius, is related by of a baker's dog at Lisbon. This dog, without ever having been taught to do so, seemed to exhibit towards the most blessed sacrament all that devoted fidelity which so often distinguishes the attachment of these animals to their masters. As soon as the bell rang to announce that the blessed sacrament was to be carried to the sick, he would run to the church, and lying down at the door, he would wait till the priest came out with the blessed sacrament, when he would join the procession, running from one side to the other, as if he was deputed to keep order. Once the bell was rung about midnight, the dog instantly jumped up to go in all haste to the church, but the doors of the house being all locked so that he would not get out, he went to his master's room, whining and barking, in order to awaken him, but not being successful, he went to another person, whom he pulled by his clothes to the door of the house, and held on him till he opened it. Once in Holy Week he watched for twenty-four hours successively when the Blessed Sacrament was exposed in the sepulchre. He would not permit the slightest indecorum in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, and so long as he was in the church, no one dared to sit or stand. On one occasion, as the viaticum was being carried to a sick person, he found a peddler asleep on the roadside. He barked until the man awoke, uncovering his head, and knelt whilst the viaticum was passing. On one occasion, he compelled a country woman who was riding on an ass to dismount and adore the Blessed Sacrament. Sometimes he was mistaken in the signal, and would go to the church when the bell had rung for a funeral. In such cases, he would return home immediately. No one, not even his master, was able to break him of this habit, and whether they tried to entice him with food or fastened him up, all was in vain. In the one case, he would snap at the meat once or twice, then, as if fearing to be late, he would run off to the church. In the other cases, he would howl so dreadfully that they were glad to release him. Thus has God been pleased to give us, through a creature devoid of understanding, a a lesson in our duty. 
There is no kind of miracle which to our Catholic instinct strikes us as less miraculous than a miracle wrought by the Blessed Sacrament. The miracles of our Blessed Lord in the Gospels, as compared with those of his apostles and disciples in the Acts of the Apostles, seem natural and obvious. Once acknowledge our once acknowledge our blessed Lord's divinity, and all distinction between the natural and supernatural seems to cease in his regard, and miracles flow as a direct consequence of his presence. In the same way, once grant the doctrine of the real presence in the blessed sacrament, and the wonder is that miracles are not of daily and hourly occurrence in our churches. The word miracle is perhaps ill-selected to express that what is here intended, since every offering of holy mass is in reality a far greater miracle than anything else in the world. Every sacramental act of the Holy Church is miraculous in so much as it is supernatural. The supernatural order is as incidental to the ordinary working in life of the Church as the natural order is incidental to the government of the world. It is not the supernatural which is infrequent, but manifestations of the supernatural. These are only granted occasionally, at rare intervals, for the sake of encouragements or proof, and generally as a reward for very deep and ardent faith. As the Archbishop of Westminster remarks in his prefatory commendation of this miracle, it is a manifestation of supernatural power to confirm our consciousness of the operations of the Holy Ghost, both sacramental and miraculous, which, like his presence from which they flow, are perpetual in the Church. The present miracle is introduced to us under the devil warranty, so to speak, of the cure of St. Martin of, uh, at Metz, who narrates it, and the Bishop of Metz, who endorses the narrative, which his imprimatur in the following words. Having considered the following narrative to be as edifying as we know it to be strictly conformable to truth, we have approved of its publication. It is scarcely possible to imagine anything more likely to awaken in the hearts of Christians earnest sentiments of faith, trust, and love for our Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed sacrament of the altar, and to increase amongst us devotion to the institution of the perpetual adoration, than this simple recital of what took place in the Church of St. Martin during the religious services of that holy time. It would seem as if our blessed Lord had wished to show by a signal favor how acceptable is his homage to is this homage to his divine heart, and had chosen for that token the sudden and miraculous cure of a young girl whose faith had led her to fall at his feet and to cry out with lively faith and humble confidence, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. The statement of the cure carries conviction to every candid reader by the truthfully simpli truthful simplicity of its style. Anne Clary, who was the daughter of a distinguished member of the magistrature, still living, was sent to school at the convent of the Sacred Heart at Metz at the age of 13. Soon after she first went to school, her health gradually decayed, and after several serious attacks, her malady assumed the form of the disease, which her Paris physician described as muscular and atrophical atrof paralysis. For more than nine years, she lingered in a state of infirmity pronounced by, the doctors after, uh, pronounced by one doctor after another as incurable. In 1859, her physician had declared that she would be a cripple as long as she lived. From that time, that is, from the middle of the year 1859 up to the present time, Madame de Clary has not been attended by any physician. Her mother alone watched over her health. Her infirmities kept increasing. She could hardly digest any food. Her thinness and weakness were pitiable. Violent headaches three or four times a week added to her prostration of strength. She could not be laid on the bed or the couch without suffering intense pain, and at such moments the strange effect of these paroxysm, paroxysms was visible in her face. Her eyelids became inflamed and of a purple color. This gave to her countenance as indescribable appearance of suffering. Paralysis was beginning to affect her arms, the only limbs she had hitherto retained the use of. It was feared that she would soon lose the principal means of occupation and amusement within her reach, the exercise of her skill in fancy works. The future prospects of this young lady seemed sad indeed to human provision, but the time was at hand which God, in his wisdom, had fixed upon for the fulfillment of his merciful designs. Her resignation to God's will was most complete. During several years, a priest brought her Holy Communion every week, and she spent her time in embroidering our altar cloths or making artificial flowers for Corpus Christi. She felt a great longing to be carried to the church of St. Martin for the forty hours of devotion, which was to take place on the 12th, 13th, and 14th of, of last June. The state of her health prevented the accomplishment of her wish until the third day. On the morning of the 14th of June, Anne received communion in her, in her bed. At 12 o'clock, which was the hour of adoration assigned by the parochial regulations to the inhabitants of the street in which the Hotel Kolotuchket is situated, she was carried to the church. She, a woman of 23 years of age, like a baby of a few months, by her maid Clementine, who sat down on a bench on the left side of the nave and held her on her knees. Madame de Clary and Mademoiselle Therese de Colotesquet knelt 
the one by her side and the other on the bench behind her, in order, as much as possible, to screen her from observation. Madame and Mademoiselle Pauline de Colotisquet, who had preceded them, were kneeling in a, another part of the wor a church. Neither the invalid herself nor any of her friends were expecting the extraordinary event about to take place. After a few moments' rest from the fatigue she had gone through, and which was producing, as usual, a purple flush in her eyelids, Anne fixed her attention on the Blessed Sacrament, and after some instants' silent adoration, she said the prayer she often used at the moment of communion, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst cure me. At the same instant, she felt so violent a pain in her whole body that it was all she could do not to scream out. She prayed earnestly for strength to bear it, and then added, My God, if it's thy will that I should be carried back to my sickbed, give me grace at least to be always resigned to thy holy will. I cannot describe what, what then happened between God and her soul. She says she felt penetrated with faith and hope, and she expresses it, became conscious that she was cured. She wanted to kneel. Her maid whispered to her, Mademoiselle, you will fall down. But Anne threw herself on her knees and said to those about her, Pray, pray, I am cured. These words filled them with astonishment. Tears and sobs mingled with their prayers. Madame de Clary, overwhelmed with emotion, in a state of bewilderment, not knowing what to think or to believe, led her daughter out of the church. She could not credit the evidence of her senses when she saw her standing on her feet and then walking only with the help of her arm. They went into a summer house in the adjacent garden, and there the poor mother, whose fears made her incredulous, ascertained that the knots under her daughter's knees had entirely disappeared. Anne entreated to be allowed to return to the church, where she remained for three quarters of an hour, kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament, without feeling the least tired and pouring forth praises and thanksgivings. When I was told what happened, I went to the summer house, but could not attend to any of the persons assembled around Anne. I could only look at her in silence and astonishment, whilst with intense gratitude to God she, so she showed me that she could stretch out her limbs, walk, kneel, and hold up her head without effort. She was completely cured. God had done the work, and his work accomplished in an instant was perfect. All the ailments which had afflicted her had disappeared at the same time as the paralysis, and the weakness which follows long illness did not attend her recovery. Numerous proofs evinced it. The hour of vespers was at hand. Anne said, Anne said she wished to be present at the service, following the dictates of natural prudence, for I was not certain how far, in restoring her health, God had given back to her her strength also. I advised that she should rest, or at least, if she was bent on coming to the church that day, that she should wait in the summer house till the time of benediction. She complied with my request, but when the hymn Pange Lingua res resounded in her ears, Sing my soul, the mystery of the glorious body of Christ, she could not sit still, and hastened to join the, join the crowd which filled the church. The next day, which was the feast of Corpus Christi, she heard a mass and thanksgiving, and went to communion, kneeling at the altar amongst all the other communicants, a happiness she had not enjoyed for nine years. She was present during the whole of the high mass, which is celebrated every Thursday in honor of the Blessed Sacrament, and in the afternoon was again in the church, kneeling before the altar and pouring forth the expressions of her ardent thankfulness. Three days afterwards, that is, on the Sunday on which the feast of Corpus Christi is kept in France, Anne spent seven hours in presence of the Blessed Sacrament, hearing Mass, attending benediction, or visiting our Lord at other times when she was urged to moderate her devotion and to husband her strength. She replied that far from feeling the least fatigue, she experienced an increase of strength and vitality whenever she approached our Blessed Lord.